Hello, new faces, so welcome. Um, and I'm currently serving as your broker for the office. Um, that's a short-term plan because um, Veronica is in the process of uh, getting her broker's license and she'll eventually be the official broker of the office. However, I'm still an investor in the office, so I still have a vested interest in making sure that you guys um, are successful and have a great real estate career. So I appreciate you making the decision to join Keller Williams. So today we're actually going to be covering the documents associated with um, what you would need in the event that you had an opportunity to take a listing on a residential piece of property. Um, there's usually kind of the, the pre-process to that appointment, right? You either are getting uh, an email, some type of lead has generated into the opportunity to have a one-on-one, -on -one, a, a, a face-to-face -face meeting with a prospect to hopefully interview for the job of listing their home, home for sale. Um, when I was in, in, in business and when I was in production, I usually loved the opportunity to have a conversation with the client at the same time where I had the internet up and I could look at the tax record of the property at the same time. Because there's a lot of information on the tax record that you're going to kind of use as your basis for helping you price the home appropriately in your consultation with that prospective seller. So you'll want to, if possible, be able to kind of have that up in front of you. You're certainly kind of going through your screening process with the seller to try to um, find their motivation for why they're wanting to sell, what it is they're looking for, kind of going through all those conversations, building that rapport. But at the same time, you can kind of say, you know, while I've had you on the phone, I've had an opportunity to pull up the tax record. There's a couple of pieces of information on here. I just would like to get confirmation. You know, would you mind if we reviewed a few things? Um, usually, at this point, you've already asked what the, what the size of the house is, kind of the amenities of the house. And primarily, you're looking for bedroom and bathroom count. That's a big key issue, right? Because if you're going to be doing a CMA, you're going to want to try to find other homes of a similar amenity that will match their house so that you can help them in their pricing decision. And sometimes it's wrong. It's wrong on my house. So if you just assumed that the tax record was correct without asking me, you would show up at the appointment to list my house with incorrect comps, okay? And you want to go in with the most accurate information as possible. So don't always assume that the appraisal district is exactly correct. It can be incorrect, okay? So get that confirmation. The other thing that you want to confirm is square footage. Now this is a tough one for a lot of sellers because they don't really have a very good sense of square footage. Some will and some won't. Um, so you'll kind of say, hey, the appraisal district says that your square footage is 2,450 square feet. Does that sound correct? In some instances, they'll go, gosh, you tell me. I'm guessing that's right. And other times, they'll say, oh, no, our house is bigger. Or, gosh, I didn't know our house was that big, right? So you kind of get one of those three answers. Um, when they talk about they think their house is bigger than what the appraisal district says the house is, then we need to kind of dig deeper into that conversation and find out why they believe their house is bigger. Because when we post that home on the MLS, we're going to want to try to use the most accurate data possible. Just saying the house is this big and kind of being able to um, use that as a huge amenity for the fact that we've got that listing is not going to be super helpful in the end because as we get under contract with a buyer what's one of the things that most buyers are going to have to have completed before we close an appraisal right and the appraiser is going to do what measure the house <laughs> and he's going to use that measurement as really his basis for finding other homes that are of a similar size similar bedroom and bathroom count to help come up with his data and if we've used the wrong information because we thought the appraisal district information was more flattering, then that can really cause us an issue in helping our clients price their home appropriately, and therefore we end up with an appraisal that doesn't match what really we thought the house might be worth. So we really want to dig on why they believe their house might be different than the appraisal district um, square footage. And as a newly licensed agent, you're going to want to kind of work on your square footage muscle. It's located right here behind your right ear. As you're looking at houses and you're walking into a house, try to kind of envision what you think the square footage is before you look at it. Or look at the square footage and then go, okay, this is probably what this feels like. 
so that you start kind of getting a sense of space. Um, you can do it especially on model homes when you're walking into new home builders and uh, maybe you're hosting an open house for someone. You know, start to try to get that feel for space. And, and does this feel like 3,000 square feet or does this feel more like 2,500 square feet? Uh, because you're going to have to kind of be a little bit of a consultant for your clients when you do show up and you kind of go, gosh, I see what you mean. Yeah, it does feel bigger than 2,450 square feet. And so let's see what we can do to try to resolve that. So there are a couple of ways that we can try to dig and find more accurate data than the appraisal district. If they bought the house recently, then they probably have an appraisal when they bought the house and they didn't pay attention to that square footage. When they've got that in their documents, let's pull it out and let's find what the appraiser found for the square footage when he appraised it when he oh. bought it. We can use that as one of our resources. Maybe they refinanced during the last several years. When they had this low interest rate environment, they might have taken advantage of having lower interest rates and they got an appraisal then. Maybe they bought the house new, maybe it's a village builder plan, and they've got their package from village builders saying, well, here's what we bought, and here's the, the floor plan and the model, and that tells you what the square footage can be, right? So try to help them find the most accurate source of square footage. I would say that if you really had to kind of rank them, probably the builder is going to be the most accurate, unless they made modifications. You've got to be cautious about modifications. The second is going to be the appraiser. You know, he's actually going to measure the home and come up with an accurate calculation of the livable square footage. And then probably third is appraisal district. Okay? Now, when you load your listing, once you get, get that listing and you're putting it into the MLS, it's going to auto-populate directly what the appraisal district says, right? But you could go and make a change to that. You can change that to something else. And you've got three other choices. Builder, appraisal, or seller. We never want to use seller as a resource for square footage because that's their word against everyone else's. We want to use a documented source for the square footage. We don't want them to say, well, the appraisal district says it's 2450, but we took this space above the garage and we broke through this window, you know, this wall, and we've now got a game room up here, and you know, that's another 400 square feet, so we're just gonna add that to the 2450, and now our house is really 2850. You don't wanna do that. We've gotta use a documented source. So if we need to, you can hire an appraiser to come out and just measure the house. And they'll charge a fee for that, but it's well worth it. Probably, I don't know, 150 bucks they'll charge to come out and measure the house and give you that one page that they would have in a full appraisal that shows you the floor plan and the square footage. And that can be your source now, uh, your documented source of what the square footage is on the home. Okay? So, um, as we're also going through the appraisal district information with our um, potential home seller on the phone, the other thing that we want to get confirmation of is how the home is titled. Who truly are the owners of the property? And this is a, a common mistake that a lot of real estate agents make is they assume that the, that the um, appraisal district information, when it says owner or seller, that is the deed record to the property. And unfortunately, the appraisal district information is not the recorded deed information. When you buy a home in any county in the state of Texas, the county clerk will record who the owner of the property is at, at that time. And then it's your responsibility as a new homeowner or property owner in that appraisal district to then go into the appraisal district's office and tell them, hey, I bought this property and here's my name and contact information. And that might be different than what was on the deed. So um, sometimes the appraisal district might not be as complete as what it needs to be. So let's talk about what those might look at, what might look like. Let's say that I bought this house as a single person. I then subsequently got married. We've lived in the house as a couple for the next three or four years. And now we've decided that we want to sell that home and move into something um, different. When you pull up the tax record, it's going to have my name on there, okay? But who truly are the sellers of the home? Husband and wife. The couple. Because what kind of state do we live in? You know the word. Community, Community. Property. property state. 
okay? Which means that the state believes that as a married couple, that my spouse has some ownership rights to the property, even though I bought that property before we were married, okay? Likewise, if um, we bought it married and then got a divorce, who needs to possibly sign on the deed to sell it to a new buyer? Possibly both. We don't know. Um, it all depends on about their divorce decree and what they agreed to as a couple. The most common issue that comes up is that, you know, let's just assume that the wife retained the ownership of the property. She gets the house. And that's what she heard in divorce court is, you're going to get the house, and you get to make the decisions concerning its future disposal, blah, blah, blah. However, they still had a mortgage on the property. And the mortgage company could care less that they got a divorce. The mortgage company's not going to go, oh, I'm so sorry it didn't work out. Yeah, Mr. Husband, we'll no longer make you um, responsible for the mortgage. We're just not going to look, look at her because she's now the owner of the house. They could care less, okay? So there's not really anything that can happen to the deed. The deed's still gonna be in both of their names, even though the divorce decree says she got the house. So we need to find out who specifically needs to sign in the form, in, in the instance of a divorce, by having a title company take a look at their divorce decree, along with what was really recorded at the county level. So turn to a title company at the time that you have the opportunity to list this property and ask them to take a look at it and it help uh, um, determine who needs to, to sell this house, who has the legal right to sell this house. Because she heard that she did, but after the title company kind of looks at it, well, she had the right to live in the house, she had the right to make the decision about the sale of the house, but when it all gets settled, he's still an owner of the house and he's gonna get some of the proceeds, maybe even at closing, right? That can happen sometimes in a divorce decree. So we don't need to be claiming to be attorneys and looking at those divorce decrees and trying to figure out what's right or wrong. We're gonna look at the gatekeeper to the transaction, which is our title companies. The title company is not gonna let it close unless they feel that they've got um, the appropriate people signing on the deed. So why don't we get them involved now and make sure that that's all clear, okay? Third issue that can come up with ownership is death. Um, and when we have um, properties that was owned by um, one or more individuals and one of those owners has died, um, and so now we're left with um, whoever owns the property now or whoever um, has been deemed to settle the estate, then we gotta do again some research on that. And again, the title company can be super helpful to pull that information out. It's not impossible to sell property when there wasn't a will. It just means there needs to be some things that take place. We have to deal with um, um, inheritance issues and um, making sure that nobody has claims on the property. And so the title company can help you with that process and help the sellers with that process. It just means we're gonna have to have a few documents um, kind of dealt with so that we can close. Now, if there was a will, and if it was probated, then now a court has appointed the person that's responsible for the disposal of that property or has the legal right to dispose of that property. It could be the surviving spouse, right? Or it could be another person that was named as the executor of that person's estate. So um, that will also come up in the court records. The title company can determine who truly is the owner of the property by looking at what took place in the probate of that will. So again, title companies can be super helpful. Do we need to do this before we actually list the house? Um, I wouldn't say you necessarily have to do it before, but I would sure do it immediately, okay? I mean, if you need to put the house on the market and you're trying to get the title company to make sure it's all good, that's probably okay, but I wouldn't accept a contract until I knew that we had the legal right to sell the property, okay? Because sometimes you end up with a relative that's long lost in Alaska, and we've got to go track that person down, and it's not going to do us any good to get under contract if we can't get hold of this relative that no one has heard from in five years. Okay? Yes, sir? Uh, 
I think we, who, uh, unless it is determined who is to, who has the right to sell the house, there is no question of listing the house by the uh, um, uh, if the seller is not the involved. Well, the, 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 the listing agreement itself has a statement on there. It's a seller representation that's in the listing agreement. It says, I have the legal right to dispose of this property without any encumbrances or issues or things like that. And so sometimes our client may believe they have the legal right, but based on some of the issues that I brought up, they may or may not. And so we need to kind of help them make sure that they truly yes. have the legal right to make that work. Yes. Okay. All right, so we've gathered that information. We now have um, a clear picture of truly who the seller of the property is. We have a better picture about the actual property that we're gonna be listing. And we're now ready to start filling out our documents and our listing agreement. And uh, when we go to that listing appointment, we typically wanna take a listing agreement that's probably 60 to 70% complete. We're not gonna be filling it out while we're at the appointment. We wanna take as much of what we've learned and what we've been able to pull together and complete the paperwork so that when we show up, we're only filling in the decisions that need to be made. Some timing issues, some pricing issues, maybe some special conditions that might show up. But most of it we wanna have completed prior to the appointment so that when we're there, it's basically decision time. It's not necessarily me trying to type and figure out how we spell things and all that. We're gonna have it ready to go, okay? So when I show up at um, a listing appointment, typically the first thing that I want to do, if, um, if I haven't already seen the house before, then the first thing that I want to do is have them show me the house. And I'm going to put my paperwork down, um, have them give me a tour. I might keep uh, something to take some notes on as we take a tour of the property. Um, I'm going to walk through the home and we're going to make some, um, they're going to tell me some things about the house, maybe some recent upgrades that have taken place. Um, I might make some notes of some issues that need to be resolved. You know, we need to declutter the hallway closet. We need to um, think about refinishing the deck. You know, as we're kind of going through the house, I'm gonna make some notes that when we sit down and talk about pricing the home, I'm gonna bring those issues back up because those will all have um, an issue, a determining factor in how we price the home, right? And as we start to go through the paperwork, the first document that I'm gonna go over with them is the one that's on the top of your package, which is the information about brokerage services. We're gonna give this to any prospect, right? Anytime we're talking to someone about um, our services as a real estate agent, we're going to need to disclose this IABS form to that prospect. They're not yet a client, they're just a prospect at this point. And we wanna walk them through this form. Now, do we need to give it to everybody that we have a conversation with? No. It's really not necessary to give it to everybody. It's really more, I kind of always say, when they start asking me what I can do for them, or could you help us do blah, 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 that's when I think we're engaging in a conversation that says, yes, but before we get down that road, I need to talk to you about information about brokerage services so that you understand how we in Texas, as Texas realtors, work. So you'll want to get really familiar with this form. You need to read it over and over and over again so that you have a really clear picture of what it covers so that you can then give them what I call the Reader's Digest version um, or the Cliff's Notes version of this form. I took it and broke it into three categories. I've talked about really the first paragraph where it says the broker representing the seller. And I, you know, kind of, talked about the fact that most sellers understand that relationship. In fact, that's the reason I'm here tonight is because you know that you want to hire a real estate agent to help you sell your home and represent you in that process. The same thing can happen for a buyer. A buyer can hire a real estate agent to act as their agent, their buyer's agent. And that's what this next paragraph talks about. It's really the exact same relationship that I would have with you as a seller, an agent can have with a buyer, except at this time they're helping them find the right properties and helping them submit offers and represent them in that process. The biggest question comes when both agents work at the same brokerage. The clients kind of scratch their heads and wonder who represents who now? Well, we go into what's called an intermediary status and there's four things about intermediary that I'd like for you to remember. They're indented right here on the right-hand side of the page. 
Number one, we're going to treat all parties honestly. Number two, they're not going to disclose that the owner might take a price less than his last um, stated asking price. Likewise, the agent representing the buyer would not disclose that the buyers would pay more than their last stated offer price. And then finally, neither party is going to disclose any confidential information about the parties that doesn't have anything to do with the real estate itself. For example, I've been in Kingwood a long time. I know a lot of people, and unfortunately, not everyone that I know decides to list their house with me, right? So I'm helping a buyer, and I come across um, someone that I know that's got their house on the market with another agent in our office. And I just happen to know that the reason they're selling is because they're getting a divorce. We go to the same church. I know that. And I know they're getting a divorce. So I'm assuming that's probably why they're selling. Well, unless that seller has given our brokerage the um, approval to disclose that to the public, then I can't tell you, tell you that. Even if you asked me, I couldn't tell you. Now, if you asked me if I knew if there was anything wrong with that house, as I live on the same street or whatever, and I do know something about the condition of the house, then I have a responsibility to tell you what I know about the condition of the property, okay? So if you're okay with that, would you mind acknowledging that we went over this form by either initialing or signing at the bottom of the form? That's really as simple as it is. Um, so you wanna kind of take it, break it into those kind of segments kind of hit the high points. They can certainly sit there and read it word by word if they want to, but you want to kind of break it down for them and get them to sign off on it. Now, what if they refuse to sign? Do we need to just stop and walk away at that point? No. No. Actually, signing it's not a requirement whatsoever. It's the delivery of the disclosure that's the requirement. So we like to get it signed because it shows proof of delivery, but it's absolutely not a requirement. So if they're kind of hesitant on signing anything yet, they're kind of thinking, oh gosh, this guy's now trying to get me to sign a listing agreement. Yeah. I'm not signing this. Then say, no problem, you know, we'll come back to that, but I do have a requirement to go over this with you. This is your copy. And uh, if you decide to hire me tonight, then if you don't mind, I'm gonna come back and ask you to uh, sign, the, sign a copy of it for my, for my file, okay? All right, so let's take a look at the actual listing agreement, uh, which is right behind that. So in paragraph one, we're identifying our seller, which is the legal owner of the property. So that's why we went through all that homework beforehand so that we're correctly claiming who the seller of the property is here in paragraph one, along with their contact information, which may or may not be the same as the property. If they're selling a piece of investment property that they bought or lake house that they own or something like that, it could be different. So you want to put up here in paragraph one, how do I get in touch with you? Where are you located, Mr. and Ms. Seller? So that's what goes in paragraph one. Under broker, you're going to name Keller Williams Realty uh, Professionals, I'm going to say Northeast, that's the other office. Keller Williams Realty Professionals as your broker, along with our office contact information. You're going to put your email address on there because you can be the um, appointed representative for the brokerage, um, and all that goes there in the broker section. So in paragraph two, we're going to describe the property by its legal and physical description, okay? Now, for the legal description, a huge percentage of the time, that's going to be directly off of the tax record, if it's in the format of a subdivision which means it's described by lot and block, okay? If you don't see lot and block in the legal description under the appraisal district, then you're probably gonna see something that talks about the size of the track. Something that says uh, like a 3.01 acre track in the John Smith survey A4268. Some weird description like that. You will not see the words lot and block anywhere in the legal description field on the appraisal district website, which means that it is not a subdivided piece of property. It is a plat of property, and we will need to get the meets and bounds legal description for that 3.01 acre track. And that could be a paragraph long, 
It could be paragraphs long, depending on how sophisticated a piece of property that is. Now, where do I get the meets and bounds legal description? It's going to come off a survey. Uh, so if they have a survey, we can pull it right off of that. It would also be off any deed records that they might have in their file. If they did a refinance or when they bought the property, you'll see a deed in there. And I just need a copy of that one page where that meets and bounds legal description is. And I'm going to attach that meets and bounds as an exhibit to my listing agreement as the legal description of the property. As you'll see there at the bottom of 2A, it says, or as described on attached exhibit. Okay? Now, the seller has just told me, I give you the authority to advertise this piece of dirt for sale. In B and C, he's now saying, and all this goes with it. So we've described the land in paragraph A, and in paragraphs B and C, we're talking about what the seller also wants to convey to another buyer. So that's where it gets into the details. The house, the garage, the fixtures, you know, the mailbox, the heating and air conditioning units, all this is included with the sale of the property. If there's anything that's technically listed in paragraphs B or C that the seller says, ooh, but I don't want that to go with it, I want to keep that, those become what? What do we call something that, what do we call something that, exclusions. So whatever the seller should convey, but decides not to convey, we exclude those from the sale. Those can be listed at the top of the next page in paragraph D, or you can utilize a form that you should find on the dot loop library called the Keller Williams exclusion form. I kind of like using that form because um, it really goes through some of the most common exclusions and kind of jogs your seller's memory to kind of go, oh yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I do want to keep that. So you want to kind of help your seller uh, really think through something that um, he had forgotten that he might want to take. Um, you know, it's sometimes the simple stuff, some built-in um, workbench that might be in the garage or um, maybe some exercise equipment that's attached to the wall, things like that that you know, he wants to retain. So kind of helping him um, think of maybe some of the odd stuff. Um, we we kind of think of the, remember, remember the, the normal stuff like drapes or light fixtures, but sometimes we forget some of the more obscure things. And an exclusions form that we have can kind of help you go through that with them, okay? And then we're also answering the question in paragraph E, is the property located in a um, mandatory POA, Property Owners Association? Um, because if they say yes, then we're going to need to disclose that inside the MLS and we'll also have an appropriate box checked on the contract and the appropriate addenda that goes with that in the contract once we get under contract. So we need to know if they're in a, a POA, a mandatory POA. All right, paragraph three, list price. This would be one of those places that we would fill in um, at the appointment after we've gone through maybe our pricing strategies with the seller. We've kind of shown them what's on the market, what's sold, you know, what our recommendation might be, and they kind of make a decision concerning their list price. Then paragraph four is actually the beginning date of the listing and its ending date. Now, if I'm at my listing appointment this evening, and after going through it, the sellers are committed to listing their home with me, but they say, you know what, Michael, you've really given us a list of things that we really didn't think we needed to do, but we see now that we really should do. So we are gonna go ahead and power wash the deck. Uh, we're gonna repaint the front door. Uh, we're gonna put some mulch in the beds out front and really make the house shine. And um, we're gonna declutter, you know, the kids' bedrooms and all that kind of stuff. So um, we'll be ready to have the house on the market on Sunday. Can you give us till Sunday? Sure I can. So what's that, four days from now? Friday, Saturday, Sunday? So, that's three days, I guess, right? <laughs> I am an Aggie, so you have to watch my math. Every now and then I mess up. So if they want to wait for a period of time to actually have it on the market, what do I want to put here as far as the listing date beginning? I actually want to put the date. 
they're listing their house. I want to list it today. I don't have to market it until they're ready to put it on the market. But I want to list it with me today. I want them committed to selling their house with me. Because the thing you don't want to see happen is for them to become the busy little beavers this weekend on their cul-de-sac and the neighbor to walk over and go, my gosh, what are you guys doing? Are you having a party or what's going on? And they go, nope, we talked with a realtor. We found out we can sell our house for this amount of money. We've made the decision to sell. And so we're getting the house ready to go on the market. The sign will be in the yard on Monday. And the neighbor says, oh, you should call my sister. She's an agent and she'll give you a really good discount on the commission. I want them to be able to say, oops, too late. Wish we'd known that. We've signed our listing agreement already. So we want them to commit with us. Now, we have a place in here where we can state that we're gonna wait to put it on the market at some point in the future, okay? So don't be concerned about the fact that if it says that date there, I gotta get it on the MLS as soon as I get back to the office. You've got some leeway, and we talk about that here in a few minutes, about when you actually have to make it active in the MLS, okay? And then on your expiration date, you wanna give yourself an appropriate amount of time to list the property, or have the opportunity to get the house sold. I kinda like the fact that this conversation is coming up right after the sales price conversation. What they wanna list their house for? Because that kinda gives me an indication about, are they taking my recommendation, are we going to be able to get this house priced to sell? Are they going to kind of push the envelope and be more aggressive in their pricing? Or are they really, are they desperate? We're going to go even a little bit below what the market might be so we get a contract immediately. So I think that kind of helps you in the decision making process on your term. There's nothing magical or required that says I must take six month listings. In fact, in this market today, um, if I was meeting with you and you said, well, I gotta have six months to list my house, I'd go, really? I just, I just agreed to sell the house at what you told me we should sell the house for. And the average days on market in my neighborhood is 35. Why is it gonna take you six months? So I think you wanna kind of pare it back based on what's really happening on the market so that you give yourself an appropriate amount of time, but not an excessive amount of time. Now, if they've been really aggressive in the pricing, then I think you need more time, right? If they've been um, more, um, when I say aggressive, aggressive for them, not aggressive for the market, but if they've been really aggressive for the buyer and they've really priced their home to sell, then maybe you only need a 60 day listing agreement, right? 90 day listing agreement. You don't have to have this big long listing agreements, okay? That's your decision on that. But the one pointer I will give you is that I would make all of my listings expire on the same day of the month. So, I'm typically gonna pick maybe the 15th of the month. I can remember the 15th of the month because my birthday is on the 15th of the month. So every time I take a listing, whatever month it's going to expire in, it's going to expire on the 15th of that month. Now why do I do that? Well, it's my system as an agent to ensure that I never let a listing expire on me without me consciously thinking about it. So if I start taking listing after listing, I don't want to have to try to mentally remember, oh gosh, is that one coming up on the 21st or the 22nd? You know, I can't quite remember. I have to get on a computer and figure it out. But if I know that all my listings expire on the 15th of every month, what am I typically doing around the 12th or 13th of the month? Contacting I'm starting to contact those homeowners and go, hey guys, you know, our listing's expiring in a couple of days. I want to talk with you about the fact that I'd really like to continue our listing agreement. Um, I'm hoping now that maybe you're, you're reconsidering your pricing decision and that um, you will kind of help get this home price more in line with what's taking place in the market, you know, so that we get that um, amendment signed to extend the listing agreement and possibly even a price reduction at the same time. Because I think one of the worst phone calls we can get as a listing agent is from our homeowner who calls us and says, hey Michael, why am I getting all these phone calls from these realtors wanting to interview for the opportunity to list my house? I thought I had my house listed with you. Okay, mm -hmm. What happened? It expired. It expired, and there's agents like y'all, right, pulling those expireds every day and calling on them. Have you ever had a homeowner who goes, really, it's expired? Uh-huh. Yeah. I so, had one, she's like, well, the sign's still in the yard. I'm like, <laughs> you're not 
You're not on the market right now. <laughs> yeah, you're not on the market. So I think that's a system that you can employ and utilize uh, to kind of help keep you ahead of, of what might happen. Because your goal as a real estate agent is to list homes, right? List to last. Have you ever heard that term before? Mm -mm. Top agents list to last. Take more listings. When you look at the top producers around us, are they all working with just buyers? No, they take listings. So you want to take listings too. So hopefully at some point you're carrying 10, 12 listings at any one time. And it sometimes kind of gets a little screwy trying to keep track of them all. So we come up with these systems to ensure that you're properly servicing those clients. All right, paragraph five is our compensation paragraph. And the thing that I want to make sure you remember about this is that the seller pays the entire compensation to the listing brokerage. And then the listing brokerage cooperates with other brokerages in the sharing of that fee, okay? So if our goal as a listing agent is to earn 3%, and our goal is to try to make sure that whoever brings the buyer to the transaction earns 3%, we need to put 6% here, right? So don't just put 3% here thinking, well, that's what I charge. Good luck, buyer. Whatever you want to negotiate. We are actually negotiating for the buyer right now. So we're, co we're collecting the entire commission, and then we're cooperating that commission with other brokerages that bring the buyer to the transaction. Now, there's nothing magical about 6%. You can certainly have something more. You can certainly have something less. So don't think that 6% is a like ceiling that can't be exceeded. You can certainly charge more on, on listings. In fact, if you were listing vacant property, I would absolutely charge more than 6%. It's going to take longer to sell. You're going to have to spend more time marketing that property. It's probably going to be a lower value, so we want to make sure it's kind of worth your time and energy. So there's nothing wrong with taking an 8% or even a 10% commission on uh, a piece of property. Is that normal in today's environment? Mm -hmm. So what to put here? You're putting the total compensation that the seller is paying. To the, uh, to the, the listing brokerage. For the buyer as and, well also. Mm -hmm. Combined. Yeah. Because we're then advertising what we would pay a buyer's agent that brought the buyer to the transaction. Not the seller, we are, as the listing brokerage. So we're negotiating the full compensation here. Okay? 6% of the sale price. Or Typical on most residential properties, yes. And what about the second item? Okay, I'll get to that in just a minute. So if, you're gonna, if you are going to charge 8% because of the marketing, and it, like it, say you're doing the $300 photographer and, and you're doing the open houses with the wine and cheese, then you would just say 3% on the MLS for the buyer's agent, and the rest you would just it would go to you. That's one way to do it. Is that how you do it? Well, I would say that um, typically the percentage is I'm going to try to share that compensation 50-50 with the other agent. So if I was listing a residential piece of property, my goal is to get 6% on a house, okay? And then share that 50-50 with the agent on the other side of the transaction. However, there can be things that come up in the conversation that cause me to think that, well, maybe I need to do something different. A very common concurrence would be that when I'm talking with that seller and I say, why are you guys selling? It's a great neighborhood. They go, well, you know, my, my husband's job is moving from the 249 corridor to the Highway 59 corridor. And we really want to be closer to his work. So we're going to be moving that direction. So what's the next word out of my mouth? Do you have an agent on your Do you side? have an agent <laughs> that's going to help you on that buy side? They go, no, we want to talk to you about that too. Well, great. Uh, when I meet with you at our appointment, I'll absolutely cover my multiple transaction program that I have. Okay, so if I, as an individual agent, have made the decision that I'm going to offer a package that gives a seller a concession if they list with me, when I can also be the buyer's agent when they purchase, that's my multiple transaction program. All right, and here's the way that would work. Here in paragraph 5A1, I would still put 6% because that's what I charge. But in paragraph 15, on page 8, under special provisions, I would insert language that talked about how they earned the concession. So I'd say something like, 
If Michael Clapp serves as the buyer's agent on the purchase of your next home, 1% from the sale of this property will be credited at that closing. Can we say it again? I'm if sorry, Michael Clapp serves as the buyer's agent on the purchase of your next home, 1% from the sale of this property will be credited at that closing. So by saying that and by agreeing to that, what technically did I just take as far as a listing? What's my compensation on the listing? Right, so I took a 5% listing, right? Oh, yeah, right. Because I'm going to give them 1% back. But only if what? If I get to be their buyer's agent on what they purchase, and I'm going to earn how much when they buy? Probably three. Maybe three in a BTSA, whatever it is that's being offered on what they decide to buy. And so how would that be the compensation with the uh, other uh, listing uh, buyer agent? So when I put it in the MLS, I'm going to put 3%. Okay. Okay? So, but it's going to be 5% altogether. So, so basically you're going to get two and he's going to get three. Right. Okay. But he's also got the he's got. Right. The but I have, yeah, but I've the tied them into a purchase out. transaction. Right. So you now, if they call them. me up after we've got their house under contract, we've been out looking at houses to try to find them the right house, and we're frustrated. We're not finding what they're looking for, and I drop them off, and I say, "We'll, we'll hit it again tomorrow," you know. And um, I call them tomorrow afternoon, and I found another listing that came up that might meet their needs. And I go, well, Michael, you know, after you dropped us off, we decided to go drive and visit some friends that live in a neighborhood, um, kind of where we've been looking. Um, but it's a new house, and we, we just didn't want to do a new house again. But the model home was still open. So we walked into the model home, and they're doing this unbelievable deal. So we ended up buying a, buying a house last night. Am I on that deal? You should be, right? Did I take them to that house? No. Why is it an unbelievable deal? Because the sales counselor saw them walk in without an agent, and he made them an unbelievable deal. Now, I probably could have gotten them the same deal if I'd walked in there with them, but the sales counselor made it sound like they could only get that deal if they didn't have an agent. But they did have an agent. But they didn't tell them that they had an agent, and I wasn't the reason that they went to that home. He didn't procure the property for I didn't register them with that builder. You've got to be present at new home sales. Mm -hmm. you, you can't just let your client walk around and walk through model homes and say, call me if you find something you like. Even if you have uh, an agreement. If I have an agreement, does the builder owe me commission? It should, because you have an agreement. Is my agreement with the builder? No. The, 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 the client owes you. I have, have to too. sue my clients to get my commission. Yeah, okay. And, uh, that's kind of like the last thing you want to do if you want to give your wife, right? Right. How does that right. work? Right. Well, well, if you want to, if you see your client, the word's going to get out that you're the agent. Because are you in control of the conversation they have for the rest of the time that they live in that neighborhood at the swim meets and at the park that's and true. at yeah. the Funko group? And you know what our agent's doing? They're suing us. Yeah. Boy, isn't that great? So what if they <laughs> came in there and just showed them your card? If they walked in with my card and they said, this is our agent, we absolutely want our agent to be present, then the home sales counselor would probably do that. But He's going to try to talk to you. It's like they have amnesia <laughs> sometimes. So it's amazing how they forget <coughs> that process. And is it because they think they're getting a better deal if they're not represented? But you can always have a conversation with your clients and say, look, if you really want to go by yourself to look at them, let me know which ones you're going to so I can register you. And then you can call ahead and register them. Yes, you can. Yeah. Especially if you know if you're busy. Right. Build a great relationship with these sales counselors. You'd say, hey, hey, I've, I've given your 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 home to a couple of my clients. Um, I'm going to be out showing some other clients this afternoon. This afternoon, they may drive by, so I just want to give you a heads up. They may come in. The, most of the sales counselors will absolutely protect you on those kinds of deals because you sent them, and you were the reason they're going by that property. But if they're just out wandering around. Those sales counselors, as much as they like to work with realtors, they'll they'll take them, and that's unfortunate, but it just happens. So you need to be aware of the fact that just because you have a buyer representation agreement does not secure your compensation. So, so tell me, in reality, if somebody walks into a builder like that, do they get extra benefits if they don't walk in with the realtor? I would say that the most of the national brands, absolutely, there's no additional benefit. 
But you have to remember, those guys are spending a lot of money on marketing, right? Big ads in the paper, ads on TV, ads you know on billboards. They're dry, They're trying to drive traffic to their community. So what they're what what they're not when they're not having to pay another realtor, they're they're spending that money on you know their product. So they're not giving the client really any kind of discount. They kind of sometimes want to make them think they're getting a discount, right. but they're really not. All right, let's keep going. So. That's one way that you might deal with a, a commission concession there in paragraph five is especially when they might end up being a multiple transaction uh, type client and how you make it contingent upon them also uh, working with you as the buyer's agent. Because if you just say, oh great, I'll help you buy another house, let's do a 5% deal here. If they wander on you and don't use you, what do you, you can only charge them 5%. You can't come back and say, hey, well, that was only a few, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you've, you've lost them at that point. You're contractually obligated to 5% here, unless you put 6% and said you get to give them 1% back, you know, when they actually work with you as a buyer's agent. So now let's move on to the second part. Yes, 5A2. So 5A2 would be additional compensation that you could consider charging your client. So in addition to the percentage, most agents that utilize this do it in a flat fee format. So I might have 6% in paragraph 5A1, and then in 5A2 have a flat fee as an additional charge, $350, $400, $450. Now that kind of fee is what you're kind of referring to is to cover that additional level of service. It should be for something that you are doing above and beyond what the average agent is providing most sellers. So if part of your package is to hire a photographer, is to provide virtual tours, is to um, do a catered open house, whatever it is that's part of your marketing plan for that property, then you can certainly charge that additional fee, okay? Now, if you put that fee here, you're only getting that fee at closing. You're not getting to collect the fee up front. Right? You're getting the fee at closing. But it's additional compensation to you. It's more commission. As opposed to a percentage commission, it's a flat fee commission. So you would earn the 3% plus that fee. Would you have to specify uh, what you're going to use the uh, fees for? or Not, not here, okay. but it would be on your marketing presentation to the client. Okay. A great way that I like to say, to do it, or at least kind of give them um, a, something to relate it to if I'm going to charge that fee, is first class airfare. Yeah. So if I was flying from here to LA on United Airlines and I go online to book my flight, I've got two different classes of service that I can purchase, right? I've got a coach or business first. This business first costs me more. Sure it is, significantly more. Now, when we all get on the plane, are the people in first class going to get to LA faster than that? No. We all left Houston at the same time. We all pulled up to the gate in LA at the same time. However, they got to get on the plane first and they get to get off the plane first. And they get additional services during their flight. Bigger seats, complimentary cocktail, some warm nuts. You know, fresher food. Right, a real fork. <laughs> I, 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 your coffee cup is glass. That's right. That's right. So, you know, if I was going to charge this fee, I would call it first class service, something like that. Here, here's what you're going to get when you hire me, and 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 you're gonna, this is this is what I charge for that first class service. Okay. Now, if you're planning to institute that kind of fee, fee structure. You need to present it to every seller that you have a listing presentation to. You can't walk in and go, ooh, I bet I can get it from these people, and put it on your form. You've gotta present it, you've gotta make it a part of your policy, okay, as an agent. Because you want to avoid your fair housing issues to where you're charging it with some and not charging it with others. So make sure that you're being um, completely compliant, however, your commission is negotiable, okay? So during the presentation part, you can certainly negotiate it away. 
Because if I had 6% and $350 here, and I'm at this point in my listing presentation, and the clients go, oh, wait, hold on a minute here. 6%, we really were thinking we were going to be able to hopefully get 5% because you know the houses are selling so much faster and blah, blah, blah. And, and it's not only that, you've got this other fee on here. And you go, well, yeah, that's for all these other services that I told you that I provide. Um, and so, um, and, and I really am not going to be one of those agents that lets you pick and choose which services you want. When you hire me, you get it all. But here's what I'm willing to do is um, I have to charge the 6%, but I will get permission to waive the $350. Is it better to give up $350 bucks as opposed to possibly 1% on your commission? Huh? Well, don't give it up. But if you had to, wouldn't it be better to give up 350 bucks as opposed to 1% of the sales price? A third of your commission? Right? If you're giving up 1%, are you giving up a third of your commission? Yes. You are. Of course. 33% of it just went out the door. So I'd much, I'd, So that way, you're at least are protecting your commission if you put that on there. Now, I will tell you that if you do a great job in your value proposition, rarely will you have people question it. My sister charges this. She's an agent up in uh, Fort Worth. And rarely does she have anybody question what she charges, because she's done such a great job telling them what they're getting when they hire her. So, all right, moving along here. Oh, one note, footnote to that. That is considered additional co um, commission. So when you do your green sheet, when you're filling out your paperwork after it's getting ready to go to closing, you'll need to put it on your green sheet, and it is a part of your split. Okay. So it does get split if you're splitting with the office, or if you're 100%, that's 100% yours. But even though you're splitting it with the office, what does it help you do? Cap. Get to 100% <laughs> faster. Yeah. All right, in the middle of the next page, under protection period, protection period is what I like to call the veiled threat in the agreement. It's really one that we're ever <coughs> going to employ or enforce, but we kind of like for the seller to think we would. Okay, so protection period. Typically, 90 days is going to be your time period there in E1. Okay, but here's the way the protection period works once your listing either expires or terminates, if the seller goes under contract with anybody that was um, that the, the property was brought to their attention during the term of your listing agreement, the seller owes you the commission. Okay. However, if you relist the property with another Texas realtor, excuse me, the protection period goes away. So it's really to keep a seller from, from um, using your services to bring all this attention to their property and then terminating with you and then calling up for everybody who saw the house and go, come back now, I can make you a better deal because I don't have to pay my listing agent. Okay? But if he says, you know what, I'm just not happy with your service. Um, we're just not on the same page. I'd like to terminate. And you go, I understand. I'm okay with that. We'll terminate. And he goes and lists with another agent tomorrow. If someone who saw the house while you had it listed makes an offer next week with that new listing, you're out of the deal. You're not in the deal whatever, whatsoever. In fact, you could sometimes be that agent that inherits those listings, right? The seller's not happy with their last agent, and they call you up, and they want to list with you now. Well, just because someone saw it when it was previously listed with the other agent, now they're back with, with, with an offer while you've got it listed, that other brokerage is not included in the deal. Will that be the same for the buyer as well, if you represent the buyer? Well, no. If you had the buyer, then... Uh, Well, let's, let's say um, that if you have the buyer and the listing it expires or terminates, but you still have the buyer. Okay, so you have the listing, but you also have the buyer. Is that where you're at? Well, actually, um, I was saying more like if the, the buyer decides, you know, to... Oh, to buy without you as their agent. Right, and then you had already, like, you have yeah. the agreement and it's not expired. If, if you use the TAR buyer representation agreement, it has a protection period language in it just like this, uh -huh. okay? Now, our own Keller Williams Professionals two-page buyer representation agreement does not have a protection period, which is why we can make it two pages long, <laughs> as opposed to five pages long. So, as long as we use the Keller Williams. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, the Keller Williams one is easier to get accomplished because it's shorter and more concise. Mm -hmm. But to make it more concise, there's not a protection period in that. Mm -hmm. so we won't see it that often. Yeah, on, that's on, true. On buyers trying to go around their agent. Yeah. Probably see them always sellers sometimes. So, like I said, the protection period is probably more that veiled threat to make them think we would come after them in the event that they decided to sell the house to someone that saw it while we had it listed. Okay. Paragraph F County, you want to put Harris County because our brokerage's office is in Harris. And then in paragraph six, this is where we're disclosing our listing services. What does the seller want us to do as far as listing the property with the uh, multiple listing service? So 6A is stating that they're gonna, we're going to put that, MLS, that property in the MLS within a specific amount of time. Now, the form here says five days. You've got five days to do that. HARS rules are more strict. They give you three days to put it in the MLS. And that's what it says. You know, it says, uh, by the earlier of the time required by the MLS or five days, which HAR is three. So you only have three days to put it in the MLS as an active listing. So this goes back to that conversation where we talked about the fact that the seller goes, but I need four to get it ready, or I need five to get it ready, or I need two weeks to get it ready. We're gonna put a new roof on, we're gonna put new carpet in. You know, you're right, we do need to completely tear out this old deck and get rid of that. I mean, they may have big things that take time. So at the top of the next page, you have an opportunity to delay the entry into the MLS for a specific amount of time for a specific reason. Property make ready, um, replacing roof, Installing new carpet, whatever it is that they might be doing. You don't have to get super specific, kind of be general, but you want to identify what that is. So if you're not going to be able to put that listing in the MLS within three days, then you're going to be checking box B. And at the same time, you've got to notify HAR that you've taken a listing that will not be entered inside the three-day requirement. And that's the last page on your package is this last form here is the seller's authorization to exclude the listing from the MLS. So you've got to fill out this form down in paragraph five, either that they only want it entered after a certain date or they never want it entered. Then the client sign and the brokerage has to sign and the listing agent has to sign and this has to be submitted via fax or email to HAR. So you would only do this for two reasons. You're not able to put it active in the MLS within three days. Or the seller says, I never want my property in the MLS. I want to list it for sale, but I don't want it in the MLS. Now why would a seller not want their house in the MLS? Well, Maybe they're a celebrity and they just don't want their house on the MLS and have everybody looking at stuff online or driving by it or whatever. You might have one of the, a high profile client that doesn't want that. You might even have maybe a client that just wants to quietly sell their home. They don't want the, the neighbors to know that they're selling uh, for whatever reason. You sometimes get stuff like that. So um, in that paragraph concerning the listing term, you've got three choices in paragraph six. Six A is getting it in within three days. 6B is not until this date or until this time. And 6C is don't put it in the MLS. On B and C, if either one of those are chosen, then you've got to do that HAR form and get it delivered to HAR. Which is to be given precedence or priority for HAR or this form? Well, the clients are going to be signing this form at the listing appointment. Um, but the HAR never gets a copy of our listing agreement, so they don't know. But they would, at the same time, we would then follow up with this form and have this sent it to, sent to HAR. So you would get this sent to them within three days after you've taken the listing. But why this discrepancy uh, between the HAR and this form? Why they, they don't, they are not at par in, the, in terms of time? I'm not exactly sure why. Um, I think they, they came up with this, especially just really this form is, do they even have the date on here? Yes, 4 of 14. So it's really just coming up on being a year old, this R form. And what happened was is the market had gotten so hot 
2013, the beginning of 2014, that agents were taking listings and never putting them in the MLS. They were even putting signs in the yard, but they were never putting it in the MLS. And HAR, because we all kind of cooperate, you know, agree to work together, kind of wants to know, is that really the intention of the seller to not put in the MLS? Or was that just the agent's decision so that the agent could get the phone calls and get that house sold without ever really putting it in the MLS? So HAR now says, if you're going to be a member of HAR and you're going to do that, you've got to get the seller's authorization to do it, and we want to know about it. And so if that's you do that. Well, technically, they can fine you or they can revoke your membership if you found to be in violation of not doing it. What would be the benefit of an agent doing that, not wanting to put it on the MLS? Really? Inside of By putting a sign in the yard? They're still represented by, I mean, you're still being represented by the broker. You still. But if it's not on the MLS, your broker doesn't even know that you've listed it. So the people driving by that property are calling their agent up going, hey, a new listing just hit the street. Look it up. And they're going, I can't find it. It's not on the MLS. Really? There's a sign in the yard. It's right here. I can't find it. Well, I'll just call that agent. So the client now calls you, the listing agent, and you now pick up that client and you double side the transaction. You're too young to think. Yeah, I didn't think that way. <laughs> you'll, you'll run into a few of those out there. So they're there. It's unfortunate, but that's the reason. So. All right, paragraph seven, access to the property. So the seller is now authorizing access to the property. And also, we want to disclose that we're going to be utilizing a showing service to set up the appointments for the agent showing. So that in paragraph B, we're going to insert centralized showing service because we utilize their service to set and track the appointments for the showings of the property. So there in paragraph B, we'll put centralized showing service. And then in paragraph C, we're going to get the seller's authorization to put a key box on the property. So C1 is, um, you typically want that box checked. Broker is authorized to put a key box on the property. And as a full service brokerage, you want to utilize the Supra electronic key boxes, not combo locks. Okay? <laughs> um, you know, I think discount brokers use combo locks because they don't spend the money for the combo for the uh, super boxes. So you want to, as a part of your um, justification for charging the fee that you charge. You want to use that box. It's got lockout features. It's got safety features. It's got tracking features. You can even set that dude up to where anytime someone opens that box, it sends you a text message letting you know that someone has opened up one of your super boxes so that you can then coincide that with CSS, kind of going, oh, yeah, Marianne set an appointment to show it, and she's there now. Yes. Or you get an email or a text that it's being shown, and you're like, well, I didn't get notified that there was a showing today. Is that a problem? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's a problem. <coughs> so I think it's good to utilize the great service that Supra offers and um, put that, that on the property. Now, if the homeowner goes, oh, I don't like those things. They're clunky. They're going to mark up my front door. It doesn't have to be on the front door. It should be easily accessible. So you could find maybe a, a, a water faucet near the front or possibly a piece of railing that you can attach it to. Um, I did one time where I put it all, I had a, a light fixture that, you know, kind of one of those um, carriage light fixtures that was on the front. I could put it on there that made it um, not clunky on the front door. So if the client doesn't want it on the front door, there's no requirement to make it go on the front door. But I found, I found it hard. They've got the little, the like koozie type material mm -hmm. to put on the, it slides yep. on there and it'll protect it from hitting the yeah. door too. Mm -hmm. And some of the vendors will even give you those. I've, I've seen home warranty companies okay. kind of give you those little protectors that you can put on there. So um, if that's the reason, there's ways to get around that. Um, and don't let them not allow a lockbox. If they go, we're home all the time, just send them over, that's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. We need to explain to them that sellers need to be um, out of the property anytime a showing takes place. Buyers want to feel that they can walk through the property without the sellers 
sitting there or following them around the house or even sitting on the back porch. Buyers want to have kind of um, uninterrupted, um, uh, unobserved showing of the property. So help your clients understand how that works and also help them understand that most buyers are typically going to make two hour, one and a half hour windows of when they're going to show the property. Some sellers, if you don't tell them, think the house is going to be shown for two hours or one and a half hours. That's not what they're, they're not hearing it correctly. The appointment is that the house will be shown sometime during these two hours. So they can stay at the house. They don't have to vacate the house for two hours if it's not convenient for them to do so. But once the appointment does arrive, they should vacate the property. They should go run that errand. They should go sit at the park for 15 or 20 minutes. Most showings won't take more than 15 minutes long. They can walk next door, visit the neighbor, but um, help them understand that they really should vacate the property, that the agent who's showing the property understands to lock it up upon departure and, and to leave it the way they found it, okay? You also wanna help your clients understand that when they leave the house each day for work, they need to leave the house in show condition. It should not be under the impression that homes are only going to be shown in the evenings and on the weekends. Serious buyers are looking at houses all day long. And so your client needs to make sure that when they leave, they're leaving that house in show condition. When they got kids, I know it's tough. And I've had agents that have sometimes can come up with little reward systems for the kids. You know, we need to help mommy and daddy get the house sold. So here's this chart, and every day that you have your room cleaned up so we can get your house sold, you're going to put a sticker, and every week I'm going to come and bring a prize. As long as, you know, there's all kinds of little games you can play sometimes with kids. Kind of get them involved in the process. Um, I think that's it on the showing. Oh, one last thing on showing the property. Help your clients also understand that they need to remove valuables and confidential information. It shouldn't be just sitting out, asking for someone to pick it up. Prescription medications, bills, you know, identity theft is an issue. And <coughs> even though the client is going to be accompanied with an agent, the client and the agent aren't going to hold hands and walk through the house together. <coughs> you know, you end up showing a house with a couple. He's off this direction and she's off that direction. You can only follow one of them. So you want to help. Um, there not be a temptation or an issue that could cause something to disappear, okay? All right, paragraph eight, cooperation with other brokers. So up at the top of paragraph, of, of the next page, in paragraph 8A and 8B, we've got a distinction between MLS participants and non-MLS participants. And then underneath each one of those, We've got sub-agency and buyer agency, right? Representing as a buyer, representing as a sub-agent. Under both A and B, where it says sub-agent, you need to put zero or NA. We are not going to agree to compensate sub-agents, okay? We're only going to cooperate with buyer agents. So when you're entering into the MLS, you're going to have an option to put sub-agent and agent. You're going to put zero or NA in that sub-agent field, and you're going to put the appropriate compensation in the buyer agent. So now, if we've made the attempt that we want to make sure that we're always <laughs> offering a 3% commission to a buyer's agent, then under paragraph A1, that's where that 3% would go. Correct? What's the difference between an MLS participant and a non-MLS participant? A non-MLS participant is still going to be a licensed real estate agent in Texas, but probably, well, will not be a member of the Houston Board of Realtors. It's typically going to be a friend or a family member of the buyer. So, they're helping that person buy a home in your neighborhood that you've got a listing. And you get a phone call from Mary Ann, who introduces herself as a um, coal banker agent from Austin, who's here helping her daughter and son-in-law buy their first house. And of course, you know, 
Um, they didn't want anybody else helping them except mom. So she's here this weekend helping them find the right house. And your listing on Maple Brook appears to meet their needs based on what they can find out online. Now, when they're looking out online, what are they looking at? Hard. But they're only looking at the public side of hard. The, the hard.com, what any consumer could look at. Can she log in and look at the MLS? Not if she's not a member. Not if she's not a member. What's the other thing that she can't do if she's not a member? She doesn't have a super key. Right? Right. She has a super key in Austin, and it works on all the boxes in Austin, but not the boxes here. You can't go buy super keys in Austin that are for $75 and bring them here and put them on your listings. I don't know that they're $75 lost in Austin, but don't go be buying somebody else's super keys because they're a sale and, and put them on your listings here. They've got to be HAR programmed supras, super boxes, okay? So when you get that phone call, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to be the agent that opens that property for them and shows it to them because she can't do it. If they decide to run an offer on the property and now they want to come back and take a look at it maybe one more time, um, who needs to open it for them then? You. Grandma's in town next weekend and the kids want to show it to Grandma. Who needs to open it now? You. Okay? So do you think it's appropriate to compensate a non-MLS agent at the same rate that you would compensate a fellow MLS agent? I vote no, but it's your decision. <laughs> so you might think about putting in paragraph B somewhere in the two, maybe two and a half percent range. Okay? Now what does that mean as far as the total commission to the seller? Did it change? It did not. Paragraph five is a fixed amount. 6%. But now we've said if a non-MLS agent brings the buyer to the <coughs> transaction, I'm only going to compensate them 2%. What happened to that other 1%? It goes to me. It goes to me. I net the difference. I now have 4%. Do what? For all the traveling. That's right. I had to do more. I like it better than that. Than I had to do <laughs> for someone else. I think it's fair. But guess what you must do when you talk? What did I name her? Joanne? <laughs> I use all kinds of names. Whatever this other agent's name was, when she called me up and you know she's talking about it and she's introducing herself and, and she asked, can you show us your listing on Maple Brook? I have to go, I would love to offer to open that house to you. Um, but I need to let you know that it doesn't look like, obviously, that you're a member of our local board here in Houston. No, I'm a member of a board in Austin. No problem, I'm happy to show it to you. But I need to disclose to you right now that the compensation for a non-MLS agent is whatever I put in here. Because if you don't tell her, what does she assume it to be? Split, even split. Or three, typically, right? Because she can't see that. Does the public HAR talk about compensation for the agent? No. No, only the MLS does. In fact, the MLS is our compensation agreement with other agents, with our fellow MLS agents. That is our compensation agreement with them. Okay? So. And, and what if the other broker is a sub agent, he means home what to put here? A sub agent is an agent that is not one of my licensed agents, but is not acting as a buyer's agent for the buyer, right. but is assisting them in the purchase of the property. So they end up becoming a sub agent of, they end up representing the seller as a sub agent because the buyer has refused buyer agency with them. So uh, what to put in then? Zero or NA. Zero. Zero NA. We're not gonna, we're not gonna compensate sub-agents, so therefore we don't get sub-agents. Right. When you look at the MLS and you see any compensation for sub-agents, it's probably a listing agent that doesn't know what they're doing. So you'll put zero or NA in sub-agents in the MLS. Do you ever see it out there? I have seen it several. I hope it's none of ours. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is everyone cool on that one? Paragraph 9, intermediary. 9A, intermediary status authorized. We want 9A checked. 
because the alternative is 9b saying no intermediaries um, authorized. We want the seller to give us intermediary authorization. Because we're hoping that one of the reasons they might be hiring us is because our listing presentation, we talked about what a great team we have. And there were an office of 200 real estate agents. And you know, I'm gonna be marketing this year listing to all the agents in my office. And I'm hoping that potentially we might get a buyer that, that, that is represented by another agent in our office. Well, that's intermediary. So we need intermediary authorized. So that would be 9A. All right, we're getting towards the end. Just a few more things to complete on our listing agreement. Paragraph 11, 11B. The seller can authorize us not to display their listing on the internet and not to display the address on the internet. HAR, I do not believe, has the capacity of restricting a listing that we enter from going into the internet. When you put it on HAR, it's going to the internet. However, they do have a capability of stripping the address when it is displayed. Okay. So you only have an option of B2 there in paragraph 11. Now, you've got to really consult with your seller if they're wanting to seriously not have their address advertised. Now that's to the public. Obviously, it's still advertised to other agents who want to show the property, right? Or they'd never find the house to show it. But it's to the public. And why you would want to um, help your seller understand the importance of the address factor is because so much of what we're doing these days is mapping, right? The consumer loves the ability to map the, the listings and see where that listing is in the neighborhood and how close it is maybe to shopping or a park or a school or a busy street. So if there's no address, then that mapping feature for HAR goes, is, is irrelevant. And so you need to sell that mapping feature to the seller so that Hopefully they don't have that restriction there of B2. I don't see it happen that often, but every now and then you do get a seller who's concerned about security issues or whatever, um, but you need to help them understand the fact that you've got the super box, it's got security features, you know, all that um, is in place. And then in paragraph C, the seller needs to authorize you as to what type of financing options you can offer on the property. We'd love the opportunity to offer as many as possible, but there certainly can be some that won't apply to a particular piece of property. Probably the most frequent one that you can't offer is owner financing. So you might try to check all those except for uh, number six and number seven, um, uh, owner financing. Um, owner financing would only work on property where the seller owns the property free and clear or has such a small balance owing on it that it would be cleared at closing when the buyer put down their down payment. That's really the only way you can do owner financing. Likewise, the other ones that you might not be able to offer could be government loans, FHA, VA, or the Texas Veterans Land Program. If the property's in um, poor condition or is a really old house that those lenders, those lender requirements might have trouble getting it cleared, then it might not be worth offering the property as a FHA, VA, or Texas Vet, uh, Veterans Land um, type financing on that property. We don't get a lot of that up here in our neighborhood. Maybe some people down in other parts of Houston, especially on the older property. Uh, but maybe if you're really dealing with a piece of property that's got some issues, you know, it just really needs a lot of work, then you know, th those types of financing might not uh, be available to you. And if you're kind of curious, talk to a loan officer. They'll tell you. Describe the property to them, and they'll go, yeah, I can get an FHA loan on that. Or they go, oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, we probably wouldn't be able to get that property cleared through VA or FHA. <coughs> then you kind of know what you could and couldn't um, offer. All right. Um, next page, paragraph 12. We've got some questions to answer concerning um, liens on the property and whether or not the property is... Um, has to do on anything. So paragraph 12e is, um, are you the seller current and not delinquent on any loans or other financial obligations related to the property? So if he is, we need to disclose what he's past due on as far as liens to the property. The second question is, Mr. Seller, are you aware of any liens or encumbrances against the property? 
So in other words, maybe there's a, um, a judgment or a t an IRS tax lien or something like that. If he's aware of those kinds of issues, we need to know about it. So this makes us ask the seller, you know, are you past due? And do you know of any other liens on the property other than the mortgage? So we're specifically asking that, that seller. So if he says, oh yeah, I've got a $500,000 IRS tax lien, but I'm hoping they don't find out. <laughs> we need to help them understand that they're going to find out. In fact, we should start working on that now. Yes, ma'am. Would you also put in that section, would you also put if they were past due and delinquent in, in their HOA? I think it's there. Um, yeah, in paragraph E, it's listed as homeowners association fees and taxes. And taxes. And, or they're in E. Okay. So. All right, and then the last question that's in that paragraph 12 is, um, Mr. Seller, uh, what's the name of the employer or real company that might be providing benefits to you when you sell the property? Now, this question probably got answered back when I first talked with them on the phone, when I asked them, why are you selling? And if they talked about the fact that the motivation to sell was because of a job transfer from here to Baton Rouge or here to Tulsa or wherever it is that they might be moving with, then you want to ask right then, well, will your employer be giving you any kind of relocation benefits or a relocation package as a part of your move from Houston to there? And if they go, yes, in fact, we had a reload package when we moved from Albuquerque to Houston. Then your response needs to be, great, we are experienced with relocations and we help people reload all the time. So here's what I need for you to do, Mr. or Ms. Seller, is once the HR um, department or the reload counselor reaches out to you to introduce themselves to you, give them my name and contact information, I'll take it from there. Okay? Has anybody ever been involved in a RELO, corporate RELO? Um, it's a nice feature for um, executives with companies that, that provide that. Uh, but the dirty little secret is that most of the RELO companies um, are owned by a parent company who also owns real estate brokerages. And so they like for their real estate brokerages to get the reload business. Can you think of some that might have that kind of relationship? Mr. Buffett might have that kind of relationship. Better Homes and Gardens, Cold Banker, some of those, right? The, the reload company is owned by some conglomerate who also owns those brokerage companies. So they're trying to make the client feel that, oh, well, our preferred brokerage is blah, blah, blah. We'll have someone contact you to talk to you about selling your home. And so the consumer believes, oh, well, i got to use them because they're a part of the preferred package. The consumer can pick whoever they want. And you can participate in the relocation just as well as that coal banker agent or that other one. Okay? So don't be afraid to take on reload business. Now, it... Is a pain in the rear sometimes. There's more paperwork. You're going to end up probably paying a referral fee to that reload company for that business. But most reload clients are good sellers. They're motivated sellers, right? And they're usually in a price range that's a really nice price range. So you like that listing. So it's a business decision that you've got to take. But I think it's well worth it. Okay? Just and I would communicate with my database. I did it every year. A mail out that I did every year to my database was, are you subject to relocation? Don't be fooled into using the relocation company's real estate brokerage. You can call me. Because if you don't tell them, they'll just believe that reload counselor that they gotta use that specified brokerage. Okay? So I like the question being on here because it kind of makes us ask if we forgot to ask at the beginning. It makes us have that conversation. Now, if they're moving from one side of Houston to the other just because they want to be in a different school district or something like that, obviously it doesn't count. Um, and sometimes, like the Exxon move, you got a lot of people that um, office with Exxon maybe down at the Bel Air location, and now they're going to be working from the new campus up here um, at the Grand Parkway. And they want to move closer to that. Well, Exxon may or may not be giving them a package. They have to be typically within a certain um, 
distance in order to qualify for relocation benefits. So it, um, it just because they're moving because of their job may not um, technically qualify them for a relocation package. All right, next page. Paragraph 15 is one of the places we talked about earlier, right? We talked about the concession language that you might insert there. So with this uh, paragraph 12 uh, last uh, item, uh, is it uh, is the uh, seller obliged to disclose this to uh, that uh, about the relocation companies? It's, I wouldn't say they're necessarily ob um, obliged to talk about it, but um, it's good to know because if if the relocation company and their employer is going to be providing them some benefits, it's good for us to be able to know what those benefits can be, so we can help the seller calculate their package and evaluate offers based on those benefits. Um, some relocation, um, some employers will give um, the, 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 the transferee a bonus if they sell the house themselves before a certain period of time. So we can help have that conversation with our clients to help them in their pricing decisions. So we get the offer, they can take advantage of the bonus and, and get moved. All right, paragraph 15, special provisions. So we've already talked about the concession language that could be inserted there. It's really a place to put any other kind of factual information that needs to be talked about or agreed upon. Um, there's not a whole lot that comes up typically in special provisions other than the one I mentioned earlier on the concession uh, for your commission. Um, but if there's anything after you've had a conversation with the client, they're going, well, what about this? you know, blah, 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 and you can't find anywhere in the agreement where that's covered, special provisions might be the place to make sure that that language gets inserted, okay? Paragraph 19 is a list of potential addenda and other documentation that could be attached to our agreement to make it a complete package. Some of these we're gonna cover here in a few minutes. And then our clients um, initial and sign everywhere that they initial and sign on the agreement and we're good on the list of all right, so next form you've got in your package is the seller's disclosure. So who needs to complete um, a seller's disclosure? Seller. Do all sellers need to complete a seller's disclosure? No. Are there exceptions? Yeah. Who are they? Um, the state. An estate? Uh, someone with power of attorney. No. Foreclosure. Foreclosures. And it's a goofy one. Yeah. <laughs> New construction. Yeah. So those are your three big ones as to who doesn't need to disclose. So a lot of times people get confused that because they never lived in the house, they don't have to disclose. Nope, they still got to disclose. Okay. Um, in fact, the first question on the disclosure is, have you ever lived in the house? So, you know, even if they've bought it as a lease property, or they bought it at a foreclosure or foreclosure auction and they fixed it up and now they're selling it. No one's lived in it since they bought it. Would they need to disclose? Yes, they would. So they've got to disclose the condition of the property as to what they know, okay? And I always love it when someone says, well, they've never lived in it, they don't know the condition. Really? You've owned it for five years and you have absolutely no idea whether or not there's an air conditioning system? You know something about the house. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of like saying you don't know anything about your car. You know things about the house. Okay? So paragraph or page one is really kind of identifying what amenities does the house have or not have. And then it also gives an opportunity for, I don't know if it's got that or not, because there could be something on this list that the seller looks at and kind of goes, I don't know what that is, so I don't know if the house has it or doesn't have it. So they would mark unknown on those items, okay? So really, the first page isn't even talking about whether it works or not. It's just basically saying, does it contain this component, okay? Now, the bottom of the page asks a question that if they answer in the affirmative, requires the attachment of an additional form. Does the property have a septic system? If yes, attach information about on-site sewer facility. Everyone see that one? So in your package, I've given you the information about on-site sewer facilities so you kind of know what it looks like. It's got questions about the sewer uh, septic system and what they need to answer concerning that. So would you know prior to the listing appointment 
You've only visited with the clients on the phone. You've gotten some information all about the property. You've done your CMA. You're now ready. To, you're pulling your documents together. Would you know whether or not you needed to take that form to the appointment or not? I didn't ask him. So how would I know if I needed the form or not? Could I ask oh, you? Can, you can go. We're talking about the septic, right? Yep. You can go online if it's in the mud district and on the septic. So I'm going to eliminate them based on right. what they might have. Right. So if I look at their tax records and I see that they have a utility district that they're in, then they've got that. Or they're located in the city of Houston. So they got city services, right? So if I don't see a mud and I don't see city services or city taxes, then it's a pretty good chance that they probably have a septic system. There's actually a second way that I can figure it out. What's the one thing that I did to help price the home? CMA. CMA. And when I did a CMA, am I looking at other homes in that neighborhood? Mm -hmm. And when I'm looking on the MLS, could I look at the MLS on those and see if they said they had a septic system or not? In fact, the house right next door sold last month and it had a septic system. Pretty good chance this one's got a septic system, right? So kind of use your um, investigative skills to kind of help you figure out whether or not you need that form or don't need that form. How do you know if it is in the water district, how do you know which of the two to use? We'll go that okay, good. Yeah. That's the last thing we'll cover. All right, the top of the next page, ask a question. Was the property built prior to 1978? If yes, what do we need to attach? Lead-based lead. lead paint form, which I also have in your package right behind the septic form. And really there's two questions that the owner has to answer about lead. He either has knowledge of lead-based uh, paint products in the property, or he has reports. He answers yes or no to those two questions. That's all he has to do concerning lead-based paint. Okay. Then the third question that could require the attachment of an additional form comes towards the bottom of that same page. Bottom left corner, about five or six from the bottom left, the question is, does the property have present flood insurance coverage? Anyone see that box? And it says, if yes, attach TAR 1414. Now, would you know prior to the appointment whether the house was in, not in a floodplain, this is not asking that question, that's the previous question, or the prior question. We're now asking the question, do you have flood insurance? Are there people that carry flood insurance when they're not in a floodplain? Yeah. Absolutely there are. But I, there's no way for me to know that prior to the appointment without calling the seller up going, hey, you guys carry flood insurance or not? And usually you're not going to need to ask that question. Because if they answer in the affirmative here, yes, we carry flood insurance, we're just really cautious, we want to make sure. There is TAR 1414, which is also in your package. The seller doesn't sign it. It just gets attached to the seller's disclosure, and the buyer signs it when he receives the package. So it's really just information about what a flood zone is, what flood insurance is, all that. Okay, so I could go to the appointment. I took my septic form. I took the lead-based paint form because the house was built in 1976, and they're filling out the solar disclosure, and they get down here and attach. And we talk about flood insurance. They go, oh, yeah, we're really cautious about that. We carry flood insurance. I don't need to worry about that form until I get back to the office, and I'm now ready to put this listing in the MLS, and I'm uploading the documents into the MLS so that a future buyer and buyer's agent has those forms, that's when I attach that 1414 to the seller's disclosure. <coughs> and it just goes with it. So now when the listing of the buyer's agent pulls it down for their buyer, they've got the form ready to go. Make sense? Okay. <coughs> Behind the seller's disclosure is an additional form that we as a brokerage ask our sellers to complete. It's called the Addendum to the Seller's Disclosure. This is in dot loop. It's also in zip forms, and it should be in your listing template. So if you're pulling the template across with all the listing documents, this form should come with it. So you don't have to go looking for it. It should come in, the, in the, with the template. But it's asking your seller to answer five additional questions about their property. That 
over the over, actually over time, the social disclosure now is asking one of these questions, but years ago it didn't ask this question. Now it does. Um, but we still want these additional questions answered by the seller concerning their property. And you'll see that the last one is the very first one we talked about, square footage. So we're now saying, Mr. Seller, which source do you believe to be the most accurate for the square footage of the property? And they're basically making a statement. I believe this one to be the most accurate, okay? So this one gets attached to the seller's disclosure when you're presenting it to a buyer. All right? All right, last form that we're going to cover is the uh, water district form. So I think this conversation goes really well if when you kind of lay it out on the page, you kind of got it like this. But I want to talk about the map first. So kind of look at the map, which I think is on the back side of the Stuart form. And I'm sorry, usually I, I, I print this in color so you can kind of see it a little bit easier. Um, but we'll, we'll be able to figure it out, I think. Close enough. There's really, yeah, it's really hard to see. <laughs> um, you, when you're, when you pull, this is an online map. It's on, hard, in tempo, and in fusion. So you can find the link for this map online once you log into the MLS. And um, it also has, gives you the capability of um, zeroing in you know, on your particular neighborhood. If you were listing something closer to 1960 and 45, I can put my cursor over that and zero in so that it gets bigger and bigger and I can really see the detail information on there. Why I'm looking at this map is that it basically has three different areas on it. And let me kind of give you the code. There's going to be a pink. And pink is city limit. So you're going to see a pink color on there, and that means that it is um, this inside the city limits of a city. You're going to see um, a yellow. And yellow is going to represent the ETJ. ETJ is short for Extraterritorial yes. Jurisdiction. And then you're going to see cream, which is really going to be the outside, and that's going to be for non-ETJ. I don't know why I can't spell ETJ. So what's the difference between these? Well, I think we all know what a city limit is. Yes. You're either inside the city limits or you're not inside the city limits. Here we are in this property right here in Spring, Texas. Are we inside a city limit? Anybody live close by? Uh, no. No. All these neighborhoods are not inside the city limits of the city of Houston. Now, if I went down to Willowbrook Mall, do I go into the city limits of the city of Houston? Yes. Yes, yes I do. Because they annexed it 15, 20 years ago. Yes. At the pound, the mall was built. Okay? The yellow is the area surrounding the city limit. And it's basically the city has some control over the development of those areas, even though they're not inside their city limits. It's kind of what they can reach because someday it could be inside their city limits. So they kind of want to make sure that whatever is developed there would be in compliance with most of the city regulations. Okay? Um, Kingwood for, is probably a good example. Um, don't laugh. <laughs> I lived there when they did that. <laughs> Me too. So Kingwood was in the city of Houston's ETJ. But the city of Houston wanted to annex it. They wanted that tax base. And so they annexed the, that Kingwood by utility districts. They basically took the utility districts that served Kingwood and folded them into the city limits. So there were no longer utility districts anymore. It all became city limit. Okay. And then you've got to get outside that area and you become the non-ETJ. So areas like um, out past Montgomery or um, north of New Caney. I mean, you're kind of getting really outside of the nearest 
Stevie Limit and ETJ really gets you outside that. And you sit there and go, my gosh, how far does Sydney Houston's ETJ go? Well, remember, especially for us, the airport is inside Houston city limit. So it gets this bump <laughs> and it gets this ETJ that goes beyond that. Conroe has an ETJ. So the city of Conroe is gonna have their city limit and they're gonna end up with a little ETJ. Okay, so you end up with these cities that end up with this ETJ. So why is that important? Because when we're listing a property, we need to know, especially if it's in a water district, which form to use. There are three water district forms. So let's go back and look at that water district form. And if you look in the bottom left corner, you're going to see the words HAR, HAR 400B. Everyone see that down there in the bottom left corner? <coughs> Everyone see the HAR 400B? There is a HAR 400A and a HAR 400C. Okay? And here's how they work. It would be rare, but it could happen, that you could have a utility district that's still inside a city limit. And how would you know? Well, when I pull up the tax records, like this one here, and I look down at all the taxing entities that this property is paying taxes to, I would see city of blank and a water district. If I saw both of those entities on a particular piece of property, then that means I need to use R 400A. If I look at the taxing entities down here, and I don't see a city limit, but I see a water district, then that means it's either going to be B or C. Now, for the majority of what we list here in the north northwest side of town, around our market center, Champions, Spring Creek Forest, Linlock Farms, Bridgelands, all this stuff out here, we're going to be using B. Because when you look at that map, and you look at where your neighborhood is, it's going to be in a yellow section. And when you zero in on it and get down to where you can actually read the words on the map, it'll say Houston ETJ. If you get really far north up by something, maybe in one of the lake communities up by Lake Conroe, and you see yellow, you'll need to kind of zero in on it, and it might say Conroe's ETJ or Montgomery's ETJ. Does that make sense? So that's why I have the map there for you. But I will tell you that if you're just staying here in our neck of the woods, within a 25 mile radius primarily of our market center, it's going to be Form B, and the majority of the time, Houston is going to be the city's ETJ. Okay? So now let's fill out our form. So now you can kind of split it so you can kind of look at these together because you're going to be going back and forth. Okay, so kind of lay it on your desk where you can look at both of them. I think it makes the form work a little bit better. Okay? So, on our form, the first blank says, what's the name of the district? The property is located in blank district. So if I look here at the tax records, and I go down here to the entities that are applying a tax against that property, do I see anything listed there that could be considered a water district? Do what? The mud. The mud. That's your clue for a water district. It stands for Municipal Utility District, same as a water district. Okay? So my name is going to be Harris County Mud 211. The next blank on our paragraph says, what's the tax rate in that district? So if I go back to my tax record and I look to the right of the name, it gives me the tax rate, which is how much? 55 cents per $100 valuation. So back in my second blank, I'm going to put 0 0.55. The third blank on our paragraph says, if the tax rate has not yet been established, what's the projected rate set to be? Well, guess what? 
if it's on the tax rate and it's set, you don't have a projected rate. It's been set. You can either repeat the 0 0.55 again, or you can put in A. As you can see what the tax rate is. Everyone good there? The fourth blank on our paragraph says how much bonded indebtedness has been approved or authorized by the voters. So back on my line there, how much bonds have the voters approved? 10 million. So 10 million goes in that blank. The last blank in that top paragraph says how much of the bonded indebtedness is outstanding? <coughs> and that would be 4.8 million. The middle paragraph, or the next paragraph, says that the standby fee of the property is this. Well, a standby fee will only apply to unimproved lots in a utility district. So if I was listing a lot that didn't have a house built on it yet, and it was in a utility district, I would need to find out what the standby fee is. The property owner might know. If they don't, you need to call the utility district and find out it will not be on the tax record. But it only applies when? <laughs> Unapproved. So if you're dealing with a house, guess what you get to do? Yeah. NA. Move on. Then the next paragraph says that the property is located in whole or in part in the extraterritorial jurisdiction of the city of blank. So that's where that map comes into play. If you've identified that it's in an ETJ, you need to know whose ETJ it's in. But like I said earlier, the big majority of the time, it's going to be Houston, even if the address of the property says Spring. Is a Spring a city? No, nope. it's a mailing address. Is the Woodlands a city? It's a township. I'm trying to think of what's another one that might, <laughs> might work. It's a classification. Um, oh, well, out in my neck of the woods, you've got the city of Humble. I was going to say city of LA. But, Humble, but. but Atascacita, which is not in the city limits of Humble, still has a Humble address. Mm. Kingwood has a Kingwood mailing address, but it's in the city of Houston. Okay? Um, Village, those villages down there. Um, There's a village. Or uh, West University Place. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a city, but it's got a Houston mailing address. So you really have to look at the, the, don't pay too much attention to the mailing address of the property for that purposes. You want to look at the ETJ map and see what it says. Okay, and it'll tell you. When you explode that map, it's got labels in there, and you'll be able to read them. Okay? And then the last blank on the form, a lot of people miss because they think it's just this really pretty divider line, but it's the big line right there above the seller's signature. Everyone see that line? There's a colon before that line that says legal description. So you'll need to insert the legal description of the property. For this one here, it's lots one and two, block five, woods of Northgate. Is this big line here is the legal description. And right there it says the legal description. And I used to the HOA is yeah. filled up by the fire site, but the water fill is filled up by the seller site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a disclosure by the seller. So I've got several disclosures that if I took this listing that I want to scan and put in the MLS so that the buyer's agent has it, right? I've got the seller's disclosure. I've got the addendum to the seller's disclosure. Depending on whether or not any of those attachments apply, they would also be included, like the septic or the lead-based paint or the... Um, I noticed the propane disclosure today. Yeah. And what Donna's got, and she's still sitting there, she has a, she's listing, she's on a property now that's got a propane on it. So she needs to make sure she gets that, right? It depends on whether or not it's in one of those districts. And the propane company should be able to tell them whether or not that's in a district or not. Okay. It only has to be attached if it's in a propane service district. 
Okay, because I've never seen one before. It's new. Okay. It came out earlier this year, uh, like in April of last year. I think that's kind of when they started doing that one. So, everyone feel pretty confident about these forms? Ready to go take a listing? Yes. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> so these are it would be important to get the seller's signature and authorization to list their house. To <laughs> <laughs> I just thought about the commission. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we should practice on your house. That's right. <laughs> These addendums must be on the MLS? They don't have to be, but it certainly is helpful because it just makes it easier for that buyer's agent to pull those down as they're writing an offer. If you don't put them out there, they're calling you looking for them, and then you're going to have to email them over to them. So a lot of agents, just to make it easier, will go ahead and scan those. Now, when you, when you scan documents into the MLS, you have a choice of either making those public documents or private documents you typically want to make them private documents, so they're just available to the, the agent to pull them down, not the public. Now, if you're on the buying side and you see them, can you download them and have and go ahead and have your buyers sign them and send them with the offer? Absolutely. That's why you do it. That's why you do it. Okay. Yeah. It's always better for the buyer to have the forms as they're, as they're writing the offer. Okay? Well, thanks, guys. Thank thanks you. again for waiting on me. <laughs> I don't know how to make it.